God is good, and we're launching into a new series this morning called Transformed, and I want to talk to you about the transformation that happens as Christians and believers that happens in the area of our mind, in our thinking. It's actually one of my favorite topics to study and preach on out of the Word of God, and so let's pray together. Father, I thank you for your Word. I thank you that it does transform us. I pray that, Holy Spirit, you would get into uh, the hearts of your people today and do the work that only you can do and we thank you for it this morning in Jesus name everybody said amen amen Amen. well if you're familiar with transformation in our mind you probably know Romans 12 2 and it's our verse for all of this series and it says do not be conformed to this world but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. And the Bible's saying here that once you become a Christian, you no longer pattern yourselves after the world. How many of you know there's been a pattern or a mold set that you've been operating in before you know Christ? And if you're not careful, even after you become a Christian, we can fall into that pattern and that mold in that way of doing things. And the Bible's telling us here in the book of Romans that once you know Christ, now there is a renewal that has to happen. Because how many of you know in John 3, the Bible talks about that when you come to know Jesus, when you accept him as the Savior and your Lord of your life, that your spirit is born again or made new. You know, it's in the Bible. It's not a term Christians made up, born again Christians. It's in John 3, your spirit is born again. But there is a process in which your soul, your mind, spirit, and emotions have to go through to catch up with the work of the spirit in your life. Your spirit's new, your mind needs renewed. And how many of you know we're spirit beings housed in an earthen body and we have a soul, which is that mind, will, and emotions. And and so that renewal process has to take place in our lives. You know, it's a place of frustration for Christians. I feel like it's a place where we get stuck and our growth is stunted because we feel like we're doing all the right things to do. We're checking off all the boxes, yet we're not transforming our thinking. And so we're going to talk about that actually this morning. And if you have your Bible, I want you to turn with me to John chapter 5. John chapter 5 this morning. It says this, After this, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there is in Jerusalem by the sheep's gate a pool called Bethesda, which has five roofed colonnades. In these lay a multitude of invalids, blind, lame, and paralyzed. One man was there who had been an invalid for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there, he knew that he had already been there a long time. He said to him, do you want to be healed? The sick man answered him, sir, I have no one to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up. And when I'm going, another, step, another one steps in before me. Jesus said to him, get up, take your bed and walk. And at once the man was healed and he took up his bed and walked. And so we see here, Jesus comes on the scene. There's multitudes of paralyzed and sick people. And there was a pool that they believed that an angel would come uh, every so often, uh, probably about once a year after the feast, and stir the waters. And at that moment, whoever was the first person to get into the pool would receive their healing. Now, Jesus is arriving, and it had just happened. There was just the feast, and and most likely somebody, you know, that person, that the person that received the blessing got into the pool and received their healing. So this man who has been paralyzed and laying on a mat for 38 years is left in another place of disappointment and, and discouragement from believing God from what he wanted to see happen. And I want to tell you this this morning. If you're not careful, if you don't renew your mind and transform your thinking You'll always be talked out of what God wants to do in and through you. You'll always be talked out of the miraculous. You'll always be talked out of faith. Because our minds are often contrary before they're renewed to the work of what God wants to do in our lives. Our our minds are always operating from a a different perspective than the spirit of God in us. Uh, It's funny because at the fall of man, we were all operating in oneness. And then all of a sudden, it seems like in, in our natural thinking that our mind and our flesh are against 
our spirit. And, and Paul actually talks about that. He says, what I want to do, I don't do. And what I don't want to do, I do. And this war that goes on, but there is a place that you can come to by renewing your mind that your thoughts don't become your master anymore, but they actually serve the purposes of God in your life. That it wasn't meant that, that uh, throughout your life you were just in this battle uh, against your own self, but, but God tells us that through the renewing of our mind, we can walk in that oneness through the spirit. It doesn't mean that it doesn't take us constantly evaluating our thoughts, but he's saying, look, it's possible that as a Christian, you don't have to be led led by your thoughts and your emotions. You're never meant to be led by your soul. How many of you met, have never met a soulish led Christian? Their life is like a roller coaster. Uh, that one second they're believing God, and the next second they're crying an emotional mess, the next second they're mad. It's, it's just like up and down and up and down and up and down. God doesn't want that for your life, but it takes renewing of your mind. See, uh, your brain is not your mind. Uh, your brain is different than your mind. Your brain is the physical location of the thinking epicenter of your body, right? If you're looking at the anatomy, your brain is your thinker. But it's actually, if you have the first slide, made up of all of these neurons. Are you ready for some neuroscience this morning in church? You're all going to get really smart here in Washington, PA. So if you have the first slide, your brain is actually made up of neurons. And these neurons, isn't it cool? It, it looks like a, a plant or a tree. God made you like this. They're sending off transmitters of 400 billion per second in your thoughts. 400 billion per second. And these, these transmitters are always on a continual pattern of think, feel, and choose. Think, feel, and choose. So every thought that you have, every decision that you make, every second, every millisecond, it's going all through this cycle in our lives. So if you don't think that God is concerned about us renewing this, then, then you're very wrong. And, and so, uh, you know, thinking about what does that mean for us in this cycle of think, feel, and choose, it's understanding that in this constant cycle that we have a responsibility to play. Because in Proverbs 23, 7, it says, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. What we think about, we bring about. And so our thought life, these 400 billion uh, nerves that are going around per second are actually creating the platform or the stage from which our life operates from. Yeah. And if you're not careful, uh, these thoughts and mindsets stem from our past, from our experiences, from our memories, uh, really from the perspective that life has given us up until this point. And this is a really important point because perspective really affects your expectation, which is faith. The perspective that you see and operate out of life will either tend towards faith or tend towards doubt and unbelief and the things of the natural. And I want to read to you an example of perspective. I want you to see how there could be two very different perspectives in the same atmosphere or the same environment. All of us today here are here in church, but we're all going to have different perspectives of what happens. Well, I want you to listen to this. These are memoirs of your pets. And if you have, this is Crosby. How many of you remember if you were here last week, the story of Crosby? This is actually the night before he was on death's door. Uh, we were gonna, the, the vet was coming the next morning. We were like, we're gonna have a celebration, a party, one last hurrah for Crosby. And he is doing great. I'm here to report, he is doing great. He got some extra cupcakes out of it. He was loving it. But this is a dog's diary. How many of you have a dog? You'll relate to this. 8 a.m., dog food, my favorite thing. 9.30 a.m., a car ride, my favorite thing. 9.40, a walk in the park, my favorite thing. 10.30, I got rubbed and petted, my favorite thing. 12 o'clock, milk bones, my favorite thing. 1 p.m., played in the yard, my favorite thing. 3 p.m., wag my tail, my favorite thing. 5 p.m., dinner, my favorite thing. 7 p.m., got to play ball, my favorite thing. 8 p.m., wow, watch TV with the people, my favorite thing. 11 p.m., sleeping on my bed, 
my favorite thing. Now, I want you to, to see the difference in perspective if you have uh, the, the next slide. <laughs> we have a cat also. This isn't ours, but it looks very similar. This is the cat's diary in the same house with the same humans. Day 983 of my captivity. <laughs> my captors continue to taunt me with bizarre little dangling objects. They dine lavishly on fresh meat while the other inmates and I are fed harsh, some sort of dry nuggets. Although I make my contempt for the rations perfectly clear, I nevertheless must eat something in order to keep my strength. The only thing that keeps me going is my dream of escape. In an attempt to disgust them, I vomit once again on the carpet. <laughs> Today, I decapitated a mouse and dropped, dropped its headless body at their feet. I had hoped this would strike fear into their hearts since it clearly demonstrates my capabilities. However, they merely made condescending comments about what a good little hunter I am. <laughs> Idiots. <laughs> Today, I was almost successful in an attempt to assassinate one of my tormentors by weaving around his feet as he was walking. I must try this again tomorrow, but at the top of the stairs. I am convinced that the other prisoners are flunkies and snitches. The dog receives special, special privileges. He is regularly released and seems to be more than willing to return. He is obviously stupid. <laughs> The bird must be an informant. I observe his communication with the guards regularly, and I'm certain that he reports my every move. My captors have arranged protective custody for him in an elevated cell, so he is safe for now. <laughs> the perspective between a dog and a cat, the perspective of, of two beings in the same circumstances. And I want you to think about the power of perspective because it sets up the narrative for your life. The narrative for your life. It sets up how you see things. It sets up if you're going to have uh, limits on what you believe God can do or not. It sets up if you're going to look at everything from a place of negativity. And I know this can be difficult for some people, that the world naturally tells us to pattern ourselves after these things. Fear, negativity, things aren't going to work out. Don't get your hopes up. You know, it's going to be another bad day. And, and all the while, God is saying, you look, let me renew your thinking. Because no matter what your narrative has been up to this point, in John 5, paralyzed, 38 years, that was his narrative. That was his circumstance. But let me tell you this, God reserves the right to your narrative. The enemy doesn't have the rights to your story. He doesn't have the rights to how things have to turn out. God reserves the rights. So that means that no matter what has happened up until this point, you can either look at it as though you're in captivity or you could look at it in a place of faith, Amen. Yeah. a place of faith. Now, that doesn't mean that, you know, some of us think once we become a Christian, everything's just, uh, you know, hunky-dory and everything's great and ice cream and lollipops and jumping from cloud to cloud. No, it doesn't mean that, but it means the perspective of which you operate is renewed now through the filter of God's word. Yeah. Your perspective becomes your filter if you have the next picture. I thought we would just go with the whole pet theme. So this is Crosby once again. He looks a little more handsome in this picture. But it's the same picture, but two different filters. One's black and white and one's color. And you could see how uh, perspective, it becomes like a filter over our lives. That, that I could tell you my story and, and I could frame it in a way that either you were like, she has the best life ever, or you could be like, man, she needs counseling, like ASAP. Like, same story, but the way that I choose to look at it, the filter of which I look at things through, uh, actually becomes my narrative. And, and, you know, we have to be so careful as Christians because life and circumstances, they want to create our narrative for us. They want, uh, disappointment wants to be the filter of which we look at everything through, or anger, or heartache in our lives wants to become our filter. But let me tell you this, God wants the cross to be your filter. 
God wants the cross. When, when God looks at you, some of us have let our circumstances define us and keep us from a place of faith. I could never, you know, maybe you're like, you know, I've been divorced three times. I could never have a good marriage. Or, you know, I didn't get saved until I was 50. I can never preach the gospel. Or uh, my, my family has been poor for generations and, and I didn't even finish a high school. I could never prosper financially. We've let these circumstances become our filter. Do you know what God sees when he looks at you? He sees you through the blood of Jesus Christ. He sees you through the filter of potential. He sees you through the filter of the perfection of his son. He sees you through the filter of love. And so many times we keep ourselves from a faith or a miracle mindset telling God all the reasons why we can't or he can't or he shouldn't. Maybe you're thinking today, I don't deserve my healing. Well, guess what? You're exactly right. None of us deserve anything, but by God's grace and mercy, we receive. It is a gift. So just let, get that into your perspective and your mindset from right now on, that you don't deserve it, that it doesn't matter. Your circumstances don't define you. See, some of us want to keep and hold on to our circumstances. He was on a mat he, that meant he was paralyzed. That meant he had an income. That meant he could stay really comfortable. And we let our circumstances become our security. We're like, you know what? I, I, there's a part of me that maybe is afraid to believe God for this. And, and I'm going to hold on to my circumstances. I'm going to hold on to all my excuses just in case it doesn't work out. Then I don't feel bad about myself. Just in case it doesn't work out, I can have a pity party and I can stay in this place. And God's calling you out today. He's saying, transform your mind. Get rid of your thinking. Get rid of the mindsets that are going to hold you back and create a reality and a narrative that is not what he wants you to have. God holds the right. He's the author and the perfecter of your faith. He, is, he has written it from the beginning and he knows the end. Hand it over to him. It doesn't matter what's happened up until now. Your narrative can change. And you need to be careful what perspective, what lens you're seeing it through. Amen? Amen. Get out of your head. If the enemy can mess with your thoughts, he can mess with your life. If he can rock your thinking process, he can rock your world. Say, you know what? Not anymore. I'm going to renew my mind with what God's word says about me thinking the thoughts that happen over and over again in our lives. The second part of that cycle is feeling, the realm of the heart. And this is where sometimes as Christians, we can get things a little bit off balance because how many of you have known Christians that are all up in their feelings? Like all the time in their feelings, uh, feeling led. We talked about it, soulish Christians. I just feel this way. I feel like that person doesn't like me, or I feel uh, sad. To, I feel like this. I can't have joy because I feel sad. Listen, I don't always feel happy, but what does, it, what does the psalmist say? It says, I'm going to tell my soul, praise the Lord, rejoice in him. So we either get all caught up in our feelings, or we go in the other realm and we're like, okay, I accepted Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. Now I'm going to go into robot mo mode. I'm not allowed to have feelings. And we're really good at this in the faith circle, to be completely honest with you, because we think if we have a feeling, then it's contrary to faith. It's not having feelings. It's what we do with those feelings. And, and so understanding that is huge because uh, I'm a, a big believer of 2 Corinthians 10.5, taking thought every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. And that's so important. We need to do that. But I want you to think about it like this. If, if you have a tree, uh, like we saw that, that thought, it looked like a tree, and, and all of a sudden it's, it's withering and it's, it's getting, uh, starting to die and become dead. I'm thinking about all the trees at my house right now. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, you don't just treat the leaves, you say, what's wrong at the root? Does it not have the right nutrients? Does it not have the right water? Like what's going on with this, uh, with this tree that, that's trying to produce? And, and that's how it is a lot of times with our feelings. We're, we're having these thoughts and we're taking them into captivity and we're doing really good at that, but it's just like constant bombarding and constant attack. And I've had Christians say to me, you know, uh, Pastor Joe, you've preached about fear and I'm trying to get over this. And, and I just feel like the, the thoughts of fear are just coming at me, coming at me, coming at me. And I don't know what to do. 
And this is what I would say. I would say, that's good. You keep taking those thoughts into captivity. You keep speaking the word and renewing your mind, but you might need to dig a little deeper and get to the root of the issue. You might need to take a little bit of a deeper look at this and say, what is the root problem? Is there, is there something in my heart? Is there some, a belief that I've adopted that I've let go from a thought down into my heart that needs uprooted in my life? Sometimes taking thoughts captive is the answer. Other times, uprooting some stuff is the answer. Thoughts that we have adapted and adopted as truth and meditated on them and consumed them, and now they're growing within our heart. You know, Jesus talks about this in the parable of the sower in Luke 8. He talks about the word of God being likened to a seed. Actually, we'll look at it really quick. Luke chapter 8, if you have your Bible. It says this in verse 4. It says, And when a great crowd was gathering, the people from town after town came to him. He said in a parable, a sower went out to sow his seed. And he sowed, and some fell along the path that was trampled underfoot, and the birds of the air devoured it. And some fell on the rock, and it grew up, and it withered away, because it had no moisture. And some fell among the thorns, and the thorns grew up with it and choked it out. And some fell on good soil, and it grew up and yielded a hundredfold. As he said these things, he called out, he who has ears, let him hear. And I want you to look, about, and look at this, because the Bible talks about thoughts um, and thinking and renewing our mind uh, several times, but it talks about the condition of our heart hundreds of times, if not thousands of times. And, you know, I love the scripture that we read, Proverbs 23, uh, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. And I want you to think about the soil that you're cultivating in your heart, that the thoughts that you're producing, is it... Is it just a thought that's coming in or is there something in your heart that you need to take care of? Have you been cultivating the right things? Are are you allowing and making place for faith or are you meditating and receiving all the thoughts that are not contrary to what God's word says? Because we can either do one of two things. We can cultivate truth or we can cultivate lies. We can cultivate what God says or we can cultivate what the world says and the truth is, and the choice is really Ours, because the truth is that that a lot of times your facts and truth are not going to line up at the same time, and you have to make a decision what you're going to believe, and that comes down to what what's going on in your heart. There's something a disappointment, a discouragement. Is there something that's telling me in my heart that that I need to let go of this thing? See, the man in John five, he was in between the mat and the pool. In between the mat and the pool. What I mean by that is he wasn't in the, the pool yet. So many times I'm like, why was Jesus even working with this guy? Like, why didn't he, he crawl to the water? Why didn't he do, like, he was, in my mind, he's making excuses. And then I look at the scripture again and I'm like, you know what? But he was still by the water. He was still by the water. So that tells me at one point in his life, he came so full of faith. And then life and, and not getting it in discouragement and just laying there time after time after time had, had maybe taken some root in his heart to now he was believing some things that weren't truth. Maybe he started out saying, I know God wants to heal me. And, and by this point in his life, maybe a seed of doubt had been planted. And he's like, well, uh, maybe he does and maybe he doesn't. Or maybe he wants to heal them, but not me. Maybe they want to have a great family, but I'm not so sure God's going to give me a great family. Uh, that's great. Their finances are blessed, but I can't ever seeing that be uh, my story. That's great that they are cancer free, but, but I know when I go to the doctor, you know, it's going to be another bad report after another bad report. Port. What has circumstances defined in your life? Because if you're not careful, your weakness can become your identity. And instead of saying, look, I have an issue and I'm going to go by the water and it's going to get resolved, we can say, I'm the man who lays by the mat and never gets my miracle. We can let it define us. We can let it label us and say, you know what? I am, I am anxiety. You know, I, I have it. It's mine. I am, I have a mental disorder that I am that. You know, I, I am a divorcee. I am an alcoholic. I am an addict. I, start separating your I am. That's good. That's right. Because the enemy loves when our feelings merge with our identity. And that's a dangerous place to be because our identity is found in Jesus Christ. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And he loves for us to let 
our feelings and our thinking merge with our identity, and then we become that thing. And the more we become that thing, the harder it is to separate it, the harder it is to believe that life could be different without it, the harder it is to uh, really believe that God can get in the middle of that thing and cause healing and wholeness. So what are you labeling yourself as today? Are you in that place between the mat and the pool? Where you're like, you know what, I have, I have a choice to make. Am I gonna, what, what am I going to do with these feelings that I have? Because I have some feelings. I have feelings. You're not a robot. It's not a sin to have feelings. Jesus had feelings. It says he was fully God and he was fully man. And that meant that he had every emotion that you and I face today. Yet he sinned not. So that tells me that it's normal for me to have emotions, but I can cross over in sin if I let it. You know, Jesus was angry, right? When he went and he saw uh, the people selling at the temple and he turned over the tables. Jesus was sad. He was grieving. Even though he knew he was going to raise Lazarus, he was grieving with them. Jesus in the garden didn't want to die on the cross, right? He said, Lord, if there's another way, but nonetheless, your will be done. Jesus felt And it's important, I feel like, for you to understand that you're going to feel some things. That doesn't mean that you failed. That doesn't mean that you're you're trapped and you're stuck. It's now what you're going to do with those emotions. John 5, John 5, in between the mat and the water. In between the mat and the water, I'm still, you know, I'm still believing that there's hope. I'm still believing that, that maybe I could separate my identity as a paralytic, that that's not going to be who I am the rest of my life with who I could be. But we can't let our identity and our weakness become our label. We have to say, God, I want to be redefined Amen. by you. Yeah. You have the narrative. Amen. And that comes down to the third part of the process, and that is in our choice. Remember, it's thought feeling choice, thought, feeling choice. For 38 years, he had been paralyzed. I want to take you really quick to Luke 8, 43. You don't have to turn there, but, but pastor preached about it last week. The woman with the issue of blood, she had an issue going on. She needed healing much like the man in John 5, and it had been a long going issue of bleeding. And she had gone to the doctors and nothing had changed. And, and so she encounters Jesus. And the Bible says this, that she went and she had a flow coming from her. There was issues going on with her. There was uh, physical issues. And some of us, you know, we have issues that are bleeding from us. And it goes back to that whole thought that, that once I, I become new in my spirit, everything else just lines up. No, God, Holy Spirit wants to take you through that process, but it's a process. It's not like a magic wand that is just Holy Spirit waves like a fairy godmother and it's like, oh, poof, you know. Uh, it's a process that he walks us through. And so understanding that, you know, there were some issues that were flowing from our life and, and hers was blood. And, and, and so, you know, I want to say, what are the issues in your life that God has bring, brought you to a point that now in the process of think, feel, choose, that you have a decision to make. Because some of you, your issues are bleeding all over everybody. Some of you, your issues are becoming a problem. Some of you, your issues are becoming transferred to the next generation. Do you know what I'm talking about? Some of you, your issues are causing you to be separated from the life that you've always wanted. Because if you're not careful, your thoughts and your feelings will now project on everybody else. Do you know that, that, that mindset that you have, uh, it, it's a projection. And you might say, I feel like nobody likes me. And, and that's a thought, that nobody likes me, and then I feel that way. And then, you know, you actually, you, you put out a vibe, and then nobody actually wants to be around you. Did you know that? It's like a strange thing. And, and so, so understanding that, that I have a choice to make, because at some point or another, I have to take responsibility for my issues. Yeah. And, and I can't let this cycle of life and circumstances, and this is just the way my past experiences have always been, and, and, and thinking back to, you know, I had trauma as a child, or, I, or this happened in my life. And, and, and what I love about Jesus is he always brings us to that place of choice in the narrative. 
that, that he never leaves us without choice. He never leaves us as the victim of life. That he says you can be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Transformed means transformed. And, and I love that how he brings this woman in and she has her issues flowing from her. And the Bible says Jesus could tell that, that she came and she, she grabbed onto his garment and she touched him and she was healed immediately. And he said, uh, who touched me? Because he could feel not only did she have a flow of issues coming from her, but he had a flow of virtue that left him. Hallelujah. And let me say this, when you dare to choose to bring your issues, your feelings, your emotions, your thoughts, your traumas, your past, your circumstances, your perspective. Some of you all have a really good life, let me just say that. And the enemy's been messing with your perspective and you need to practice some gratitude. I just wanted to pause there and say that. Because too often than not, we think things are so bad, so, so bad. The enemy loves to play with our perspective and make us think that we have the most horrible life. Practice gratitude, practice gratitude. He loves when you forfeit something good for a lie. Practice gratitude, get the right perspective. But when you have, when you have the faith to say, Jesus, I have all this stuff, I have all these issues, I have a past, I have hurts, I have trauma, I, I have wrong mindsets, and, and I wanna bring them to your feet. There is a flow that, that happens, a collision that happens when your issues meet the virtue of Jesus Christ. Two flows collide. And what happens in that moment is healing. Healing, healing. Do you know that those thoughts that you think over and over and over and over again are really just a series of questions in your mind? Questions. Think about it. Am I good enough? What am I gonna have for dinner? What's gonna happen in the world? Are my kids eating enough organic? Are they watching too much TV? Uh, does my husband love me? Should I change my hair color? Should I lose weight? Uh, should, is it just, any thought that you have, you, most likely you can add a question mark on the end of it. Reoccurring questions in your mind. And some of us have questions that aren't gonna get answered. Why couldn't he get in the water? He could have stood there and said, you know what? In the midst, in the presence of Jesus Christ, the Messiah, he could have been asking questions. Why can't I get healed? Why can't, I, why can't someone put me in? Why, 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 why? Jesus said, do you want to be healed? That's the question that I have for you. Do you want to be healed? And today, some of you, you know, you might have some things that, that, that created the narrative of your life. You might have a focus or a lens or, or a filter that's, that's not God's filter for your life. And you might have questions, but they might not have answers here on earth. You might just have to say, you know what, Jesus, take these. I want to be healed. I want to be whole. And if I don't know the answers to the questions, that's okay. Listen, you're living in a fight of faith a fight of faith. And if the enemy can get in to the realm of the not knowing and the questions and the would have, could have, maybe if, a should have realm of you, you'll never have a mindset for faith. There's been times in my life that questions weren't answered and I'll never feel bad about the victories I've won because to be honest with you, I felt like I had to fight for them. I had to army crawl into the pool and make a decision. Am I gonna stand by the side and ask a whole bunch of questions? Is the water warm enough? Should I get in? You know, do I feel like swimming today? All these questions, or am I going head first into the water? Head first. Some of you need to get in. You need to say, you know, I don't care what it's gonna take. I wanna be whole. I need to, maybe today, the Holy Spirit's maybe even just saying, I need to transform my thinking from the root level. That means for some of us, you know, it's the thoughts that the enemy tries to plant in our mind that are, that are just completely out of left field. How many of you know those thoughts aren't necessarily the dangerous ones? Like a thought out of complete left field, like, uh, you know, the world's gonna end today. Like, I mean, who knows, but, but that's like, not like a right now kind of thought. But when he plants those thoughts in our mind that, that we can give a feeling attachment to, or we can put an amen to, or we can say, you know what? You, you might be right about that. Those are the dangerous thoughts. 
The thoughts that, you know what, you're not good enough. You're never gonna be good enough. You failed again as a parent. Your kids are never gonna serve God. Those little thoughts, those are the dangerous ones. So maybe, maybe the enemy's attacking you with those far off thoughts and you need to renew your mind and be transformed and get to know the truth so you can identify a right out lie. But for some of you, you need to take it a step further and saying, what are the thoughts that I'm biting on? That, that I'm giving because of my past, because of my hurt, because of an area of my life that's still not whole. When that lie comes, I attach myself to it and it becomes my belief. That's the danger zone. Those are the dangerous thoughts for us. And I'm believing that Holy Spirit, by His power, is going to reveal that to us this morning. Any thinking, any mindsets, any areas of our life that have become, that we've adopted as truth. Because remember, it doesn't matter what the narrative has been up until this point, Jesus holds the rights. God holds the rights. And He always leads us to a choice. So stand up with me this morning in this place. Do you want to be healed? And that's what renewing the mind and being transformed is all about, wholeness in every area of our life. And so this morning with every head bowed and every eye closed, if you're watching today and you've never accepted Jesus Christ or you're here today in this sanctuary and you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, I wanna give you the opportunity to do that. That's when the transformation begins. That's when, uh, that's when a, a fresh start begins and we say, Jesus, I can't do this on my own anymore, but I'm submitting my whole life at the feet of the cross. If that's you this morning with every head bowed and eye closed, we're going to raise your hand up before the Lord. I'd love to pray with you this morning. Hallelujah. I see your hand in the back. I see your hand in the front. Anyone else this morning? Praise God. Anyone else? Starting over with Jesus. I see your hand Amen. If you, if you raise your hand up, we're all going to pray this prayer together. But as you pray, the Bible says that you confess with your mouth and you believe in your heart that Jesus Christ is Lord and you are now saved. You're a child of God. It's a new beginning for you. So pray this prayer with us this morning. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for Jesus who died on the cross for my sin and rose again that I am no longer a slave to sin but I'm a child of God. Come into my heart today as my Lord and Savior and very best friend. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Let's celebrate those who gave their hearts to the Lord. If you prayed that prayer this morning, I am so excited for you. This is the beginning of a brand new life in Christ. And our ushers have more information for you to keep you on track and, and get plugged in here at Champion. We love to have you as a part of Champion as your home church. For those of you who this morning, you say, you know what, as, as the word was going forth, I felt the Holy Spirit dealing with me. Maybe it's just renewing negativity or maybe readjusting some patterns in your life, or maybe it's uprooting some things. If you said part of this message about the mind ministered to me, raise your hand up. I'd love to pray with you this morning. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Hands up all over the place. We're going to pray together. Listen, we're going to pray and you're going to go home and you're going to start renewing your, your mind with the word of God. But I'm believing that as we pray today that some things are going to be broken off of your life. That only Holy Spirit can do the inner work of the heart. I'm believing he's going to uproot some things. That he's going to reveal to you maybe some things that the enemy would want to come and, and trip you up over. Maybe it's a past. Whatever that is, that there's a healing work that's going to be done today. So Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the power that comes through Jesus Christ. And I pray that you would touch your people today, Lord, that you would do a healing work in their hearts, that you would break off old mindsets, that you would break off old narratives, that the focus and the lens of which they see their life now comes through Jesus Christ, Father, that you make all things new, Lord. I thank you for healing brokenness, healing trauma. Lord, I thank you for uh, just a right thinking, a faith thinking to penetrate your people today in Jesus' mighty name. And everybody said, amen. 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 God bless you, and we will see you next Sunday.